So I've been enjoying the chanting at the beginning of our Wednesday nights together. So we'll do a little more of that tonight and I'll um, just paste in the chat the Google document that you can open for the chants. Let's see, raise your hand if you're new to chanting. Okay. If you've ever sung a song, you're not new to chanting. <laughs> it's a similar process. But chanting can be just another way. Chanting can be a lot of things, but one of the things chanting can be is another way to invite the whole system to take in the teachings. So we can take in the teachings by, through the intellect, through the, we can also take in the teachings through the body, by doing walking, by being in the natural world. We can take in the teachings relationally, in our engagements with each other, and one way to just really receive the teachings could be through this other modality, singing or chanting, just allowing the vibration and the throat and the resonance of the sounds to have some impact. And it's okay if you don't know what that impact might be, if you're new and feel a little like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here, that's fine. That's a perfectly acceptable way to begin by not knowing. And so receiving the words, receiving the sounds, inviting the words to land in the heart, not forcing the words to take hold in any particular way and really allowing the the sounds to go to leave right to be gone to come and to go as we release them into the atmosphere So we'll, we'll start with the Buddhist words on loving kindness tonight. These are the Buddha's instructions. And so you can, you know, chant along with me. I'll hopefully do my best to carry a tune for us. Now let us chant the Buddhist words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety 
May all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Let's do the refuges. My cat wants to participate. So go up to page two. We'll do the Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambuddhasa. We'll do that three times. And then we'll go to the Buddha for refuge, the Dhamma for refuge, the Sangha for refuge. And then we'll, for the second time, go to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. That's that Dutiampi. And then for the third time, and that's the Tatiampi, go to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha for refuge. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddham Zarnang Gachami Dhamang Zarnang Gachami Sangang Zarnang Gachami Dutiampi Buddham Zarnang Gachami Dutiampi Damang Sarnang Gachami Dutiampi Sangam Sarnang Gachami 
Tatiampi Bhutam Saranga Chami Tatiampi Damang Saranga Chami Tatiampi Sangam Saranga Chami Just move right into our meditation now. Inviting the words to have a resonance. Really feeling what it's like to have a body. Just connecting in some way to this embodied experience that we're all having. the warmth or the coolness the pressure the firmness The flow of air in and out of the body. In a gentle
and loving way. Connecting with what it's like to breathe. can feel quite intimate. To be with the movement of air. So inviting whatever comes with this connection. Sometimes there's resistance. Or sometimes an attempt to control the breath. You may not even feel like you doing it. You doing the control or you doing the resistance. Perhaps it's possible to Relax right with this. Feeling the sensations. The expansion and contraction.
Maybe emotion or reflection accompanies the breath. It's okay. Thoughts come and go. We don't need to chase them or find out where they lead. energy of emotion flows through. It moves, moves through us. There's no need to chase emotion either. Instead, we're committing to intimacy, the flow of air, right here in this body. Relaxing deeper and deeper. Into this intimacy. This intimacy that welcomes any experience. that emerges as an accompaniment.
and opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Go ahead and give yourself a body break if you need to. Stretch, move, whatever you need, whatever your body's asking for. I'm wondering if anybody's here for the first time tonight. If you are, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say hello. How about a wave then? Hey, friends. <laughs> oh, there we go. Look at that. Nice to see you all. Well, for weeks I've been dropping in here on Wednesday nights and saying something about how the trial was on my mind and dropping in here on this Wednesday night, I'm, I'm going to say that the verdict is on my mind. I'm wondering if the verdict is on your mind too. Yeah. I'm also wondered if anybody was feeling a lot of mixed emotions when the verdict came in. Did it feel just like one thing or was it many things? Many things. Yeah. Feel free to type in the chat like Stacy just did, much sadness. And if you'd like to unmute yourself and just say what you were feeling when the verdict came in, feel welcome to do that too. Relief, sorrow, sadness, hope, apprehension. Bittersweet is too generous. Relieved, sad. There is no English word. Neutral and unpleasant Vedana. Exhausted. I was so scared before when the verdict was announced, I cried and cried with relief. The best was listening to the family's gratitude. Forgiveness. Quite a range of experiences here even in the chat, isn't it? Anybody else want to jump in? So appreciate that. I really resonate there. All day I was I work out of school and I'm there on Wednesdays and all day there was like, I could feel it in the air, this desire to have some words to connect with each other and not really having the words to express what's there. And probably for many of the reasons that Irma just expressed, it's complicated and there's confusion. It's not clean. Yeah. 
I'm so glad you named compassion. Yeah, just really echoing what Patrice said about the, you know, and what, and what I said too earlier about it being complicated because there is this reality of compassion living right next to accountability and how as we reckon with this truth, so much comes forward for us. As Madeline is saying, just the history of police sanctioned violence, black and brown bodies, and also what Charles Lee said in the chat that no human is irredeemable. And so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Angulimala today. Um, and I'll get there in just a little bit, but I want to go to Bob first and then Charles Lee right after that. Well, I think I'll jump in with a little of my reflections about the Angulimala Sutta. And this is a, a beautiful and complicated teaching. So I just want to say that I'm going to spend about 15 minutes on this. I think we could, we could probably spend a week. There's so many interesting aspects of this, of the teachings here in this uh, story and in this one sutta. And I think, you know, what Charles Lee was pointing out is that this reality too, that no matter which angle we look at the verdict or the trial or the death of George Floyd or the family's experience or the witnesses ex you know, experience or the process, the system, there's so many different angles. Every one, if given its true attention, right attention, will leave the others out. So just keeping that in mind that no matter how I share the story about Ngulimala, there's more there to be contemplated. And that's really our job as practitioners. And again, as Charles Lee was saying, like the verdict itself afforded some space to consider more, right? And this is how it is in life that an experience itself affords, our, affords us the opportunity to consider more. And so with each experience after tonight, as we continue to reflect and deepen as practitioners into this truth of that we're living in post-verdict, right? With the reality of all the work ahead of us and the reality of police sanctioned murder that happens every day, there will be more, there will be more to consider. The complications should deepen for us. We should be, you know, faced with new considerations than we could think of tonight, right? Me too, I should be, we should all be. This is our job as practitioners. This is actually how we deepen into the Dharma, right? by allowing that to happen, by being immersed in something, by hearing the Dharma from different voices, different people, different lived experiences, we get a, a more of a breadth and depth, depth and breadth of the teachings this way. So this story of Ngulimala is really a, a story of this, this child in a community. It begins with the story of a child in a community. A child born ahimsaka, which means something like harmless one. And born into a, a culture that uh, honors the teachings of 
karma and rebirth. And that should be said right away because from the beginning there is a, this child was born into this family and there was a prophecy, something about his, that he was going to have violent tendencies or he's born into a robber caste, I think is what, um, something like that. But there's this concern that he may bring with him some latent violent, violent tendencies and his parents were um, interested in supporting the development of his full capacity so that perhaps he could overcome what laid latent in him. And so they sent him off to a school with uh, other children and a good teacher to help him learn in that community. Right? So this is a story of an individual. It's often told in this individualistic way, the story of Angulimala, but we can remember that this community had was significant and the, uh, the context matters also. Right, the context in which he was born into, and that he continued to live through. And so he goes away to this school, and he's a very really kind kid. He's a good student, and he's very quickly the teacher's pet. And all the other students are very jealous of him. And so they want to undo that and they go to the teacher they they actually scheme together right how do we undo that and what they decide is that they'll go to the teacher and they'll try to plant seeds of suspicion in the teacher's mind and so they do that in three rounds and by the third time the teacher gets a little suspicious like he's trying to overtake me Heard the story told a couple of different ways, but this is, I think, the most common way is that the teacher starts to get concerned that the student is trying to overtake him. And, and so he decides that he, the teacher decides to somehow bring ahimsaka down and as the students were graduating uh, he tells ahimsaka that it's customary to bring the teacher a gift and his job will be to bring the teacher a gift of a thousand pinkies a thousand pinky fingers so ahimsaka is a little bit mortified here this is not the Buddha's word. I'm obviously retelling the story from my own, my own language. And he says something like, well, you know, my family, we're, we are kind people. So I, I don't really know if I can do that. And he's like, well, this is, you know, your rite of passage here. So you got to do it. And not really sure, you know, what transpired there, if that was, you know, what, what kind of caused in Kulimala to Ahimsaka to decide to do it, but he does. So he goes out and he hunts people and he collects fingers and he strings them together through the bone after he's collected them. And he terrorizes na villages, neighborhoods, the forest, people are terrified of him. He gets to this Place. You know, this obviously this is an oral tradition, so we don't know if all the facts are 100% true, but we're going to try to take the essence of the teaching. So he gets to like 999 fingers, and the Buddha gets wind of this happening, and Angulimala's parents, Angulimala means uh, finger garland, so he's given this name as he was terrorizing the village. And so Ngulimala's parents hear about this and knowing that he didn't come home from school, 
wonder if it's actually him, their child, that's doing this, if it was a Hemsica. And so mom tells dad, like, you got to go get him. And dad was like, no. And mom was like, well, I'll go do it myself, right? Because mom saw something redeemable about this child, wanting to both take care of the community, but also believing that this child was redeemable. So mom goes out and looks for Ahimsaka and Gulimala. And the Buddha also gets wind of this happening and goes looking for Ngulimala. And then there's this whole situation that ensues where the Buddha's found him and approaches Ngulimala right before Ngulimala, notices mom and decides that, well, if I have to make a choice between killing this monk and killing my mom, I'll kill the monk. And so the Buddha approaches. We'll read what the Buddha says when the Buddha approaches. I can find it. So the and Gulimala is running to catch up with the Buddha. And the Buddha is walking at his normal, normal pace. And the Ngulimala is a little bit like baffled by that. Like, why am I running? And I still can't catch up to this dude. And then, uh, the, the Buddha says, uh, Ngulimala says, stop monk, stop. And the Buddha says, I have stopped in Gulimala. Do you stop too? And then in Gulimala stops for a second and is like, well, should I ask what he meant by that? <laughs> and does like, you said I have stopped too. What do you mean by that? And this is what the Buddha says. Well, okay, so this is what in Gulimala says. While you were walking monk, you tell me you have stopped but now when I have stopped, you say, I have not stopped. I ask you, O oh monk, what is the meaning of that? How is it you have stopped and I have not? Oh, I think I missed the very important part. Sorry about that. That was a clunky reading only because I <laughs> didn't have my play saved. Okay, so, so <laughs> Gulimala says, stop monk, stop. And the Buddha replies, I have stopped in Gulimala, you stop too. Okay, so then the Gulimala is kind of baffled by this, like I have stopped, you stop too. Uh, well, when you were walking monk, you tell me you have stopped, but now when I have stopped, you say that I have not stopped. I ask you now, O oh monk, what is the meaning of it? How is it that you have stopped and I have not? And the Buddha says, Gulimala, I have stopped forever for swearing violence to every living being, but you have no restraint towards things that breathe. So that is why I have stopped, but you have not. And so this is an important part of the story, not only because it is the beginning of a transformation for Ngulimala, but because of the Buddha's directness and his ad admonishment, right? You have not stopped. You have no regard for life. You have shown no restraint. And I have learned that that's valuable here. And so as the story goes on, Ngulimala becomes a disciple of the Buddha. So he begins to practice, he takes up robes, he becomes a devotee of the Buddha, right? Listening to the teachings, receiving the teachings, practicing the teachings. And he goes to a village with the Buddha and everybody there is afraid of him. They're afraid of, they don't actually know that he's taken up robes. They don't actually know that he's not terrorizing people anymore. So he goes with the Buddha to a village and 
people are afraid and the Buddha says something like, well, if you knew that this person that you were afraid of had now taken up robes and was practicing the path of peace, would it change how you felt about them? And the king said, absolutely, it would change, right? And so then the Buddha presented and Gula, well, this is him. He's right here. You didn't even know it was him. Like you were afraid of this person who is now changing his life. But there's another interesting part of the story. So as things go on, the Buddha and Gulimala is practicing and practicing. And there are people that just can't really shake it. Like you terrorized all these people. And so he would go on alms rounds and they would stone him. They would throw things at him, stone, stone him. And he came back to the Buddha and he was like, you know, bloody. And let me see if I can find this passage. It says there were still a few people who could not forget that. And Gulimala the bandit with his superior prowess had shown them and their weakness and had taken over and killed people. And so then with blood running down from his injured head and his bowl broken and with his patchwork robe torn, the venerable Angulimala went to the blessed one and the blessed one saw him coming and he told him, bear it Brahmin, bear it. You've, you have experienced here and now the ripening of karma whose ripening you might have experienced in hell over many a year, many a century, and many a millennium. So you are the heir of your actions. You must bear the impact of your actions. So it's a story both of redemption, but also a story of accountability, right? Right here, the Buddha is not saying, didn't admonish the community for throwing stones. He was advising and Gulimala, like, yeah, this is it. And in fact, you know, that this punishment, this recourse might actually be a blessing because you almost killed your mother and you almost killed a monk, which would have been landed you in hell. And that is, you are lucky, you are fortunate that you still have the opportunity to continue to learn something here. So the story really begins at the beginning in childhood, this difficult experience where a community kind of was hating on Ahimsaka, right? For being smart or teacher's pet. And then a teacher let the best of his, let this suspicion kind of run wild in his mind, planted by other students who were doing Ahimsaka wrong. And then Ahimsaka kind of took it and run and, you know, did all these terrible things. And, and yet a mother still cares about a person and thinks that this child is redeemable and goes forward. And another person, the Buddha, then, lays down some law like, you have to stop, right? You have to stop, enough is enough. And then as part of the process, the journey of accountability and love, accountability and love, accountability and love, and a lot of bad behavior along the way, right? From a lot of people, as part of that whole process, the Buddha is like, no, you have to, you have to bear it. Right? You get to be the recipient of the legacy of your words and your deeds. This is the law. This is how it works. So there's so many. I mean, if you can, I too was watching the verdict and, and it was complicated for me. Really quite complicated. for all the reasons that you have expressed here in the room that I don't need to restate.
And I was really interested as a practitioner at how this, the strength of accountability, like, yes, this is one step. This is one perhaps big step forward towards justice. This is accountable. This is holding someone accountable for their actions and their deeds and appropriate admonishment in this case. And even then, no real, not enough of a sacrifice for all the pain that's been caused, right? And yet a human, a redeemable human being has also lost their freedom as it's been pointed out. So this real curiosity of this kind of strength that I could feel in the heart and in the system to, for accountability for truth, really, for truth telling, for accountability, like, oh yeah, this is actually it. This is an appropriate admonishment alongside the strength of compassion in all of its flavors. And that actually requires us to that living into that reality of accountability and love together, as is shown in the story of Ngulimala, really requires us to see ourselves in other humans, right? I mean, I could ask us all to raise our hands if we've ever done something that we are totally ashamed of, if we have acted in a way that we are totally ashamed of. Yeah, for sure. And now, raise your hand if you know someone who has, who has had some despicable behavior in the past. Raise your hand if you have loved somebody who's had despicable behavior, right? So this somehow like this trial has illuminated something that humans do quite often as we other, we think it's out there, right? Or the story of Ngulimala is something, you know, that was just a story from back then. It's something that's not quite right here. And our practice calls us to really reflect on how um, how it is us, right? Both the victim and the perpetrator. We have a sign that's hanging up in our house that says, love me when I least expect it because that's when I need it the most. It's hard to do. Love me when I least deserve it because that's when I need it the most, not expect it. Well, maybe, maybe that was an accidental Freudian slip or something. Expect it, but don't deserve it. <laughs> love me when I don't deserve it, but really expect it because that's when I need it the most. Like how do we, in this kind of inquiry practice that we're engaging in as Buddhist practitioners, see if we can live deeper into these teachings? Like what does it mean to love and hold accountable? To love and hold accountable, to not somehow negate, like one doesn't mean an negating the other. Like does it mean that we have to somehow negate all of the police sanctioned violence if we have some compassion for a life that is lost to the prison system? Or does it mean that we have to somehow deny that there's, that the heart actually cares about a life that's lost to the prison system? If we really understand and, and stand up for justice, Perhaps it can all be true. Do we have to deny a community's responsibility in perpetuating harm and contributing to the harm that Ahimsaka uh, inflicted? Because that began really early, right? Do we have to somehow negate that in order to hold him accountable? Or can they both, can it all live together 
in this one complicated experience and how brave can we be as a community to be able to talk about it, right? I hope that as you're listening to me talk tonight, you're questioning whether or not this is the whole truth, right? Because as I said before, there are, it's, it's so complex that with any view, with any point of view, with any way of sharing a story, there are way more possibilities to experience, to explore. So I hope that your mind is a bit critical of what I'm saying and you're questioning the places that I didn't fill out, that it wasn't complete. And so that the next time we come back together and talk, that the conversation can be just as rich as it was tonight. So thank you so much for your participation tonight. I hope the, the words and the reflections were of some support to you. It certainly was to me. Um, before I ask Patrice to dedicate the merit for us, I am gonna be gone the next two weeks. Um, Patrice will be here teaching. If I can get away, I'm, I'll, I'll be teaching next week um, at IMS and then the following week I graduate from the teacher training program, so I'll be I'll be doing that that night. Um, but if I can get away next week, I might just pop into here Patrice's Dharma. So you may see me here, but not teaching. Thank you, Patrice. So um, let's all participate in this wonderful act of imaginative generosity called sharing the merit. If there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing, we would, if we could, share it. We would happily, joyfully share it. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our friend, our community, people we like, people we don't like all persons everywhere. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we'd share the merit, we'd share these blessings with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the slithery, the scaly, all beings everywhere. May all beings find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.